Growing up, we are all engineers at heart. We have a drive, an innate drive, to grow, to learn, to play, to explore, and to build. And it seems like this drive is never ending until we reach adulthood. And for many, that drive is suddenly out of reach. My goal today is to demonstrate to you that that doesn't need to be the case. How many here played with Legos when they were younger? All right, good amount. Now, of those who raised their hand, how many did not follow the instructions and instead let their imagination guide them? Great. So I was one of you two, and the images on screen are from Lego enthusiasts just like us, who rather than build what was in the manual, they took a set of Legos and they built whatever they could imagine. Because when you receive a set of Legos, you don't get a single toy or one cool model. You get a set of building blocks that you can use to make whatever you can dream up. And as engineers, that's how we see the world. Not as finished products, but as building blocks we can use in our own creations. Let's take an example. We've got here a car, a phone. I'm sure most of us have used these at least once in our life, if not today. When I look at them, I actually see a way I can combine that car with a circuit board and a phone with code. And in doing so, I can create an RC car that I can have control with my phone. And if I put the right tires on that car, well, now I can drive around a world that might have ice sculptures all around it. And what might that world look like? It's probably pretty snowy, it's cold, it's windy, it's definitely got ice, and more likely than not, it's probably inhospitable to humans. So, as an engineer, I also wear another hat, a roboticist hat, and the roboticist in me immediately asks, how can we make a robotic system capable of operating autonomously? in an environment like the one I just described. The answer to this is IceBot. This is a Guinness World Record robot for the first robot made from ice. The body and the wheels of the robot are ice. Motors, or motor modules, provide the actuation. An inexpensive microcontroller communicates with my phone, from which I can control it and move it around in space. The motors are embedded and then frozen directly into the robot body. We press the 3D printed components onto the shafts, and then we then freeze these into the ice wheels. During experimentation, we showed this robot is capable of operating in sub-zero temperatures, moving over sheets of ice, and even climbing icy ramps. What's more fun is it can even operate in room temperature environments, at least for a short while, you know, then it starts to melt. Um, Spurred on by our success with IceBot, we asked ourselves, what other material can we build robots from? And we realized we've been neglecting a whole class of material, one we've termed found material. This is material you literally find in your everyday environment. It can be natural, wood, or ice. It can be man-made a recycled milk jug, electronics from an old printer. As long as you find it, that's found material. Animals are really good at using material from their environment. The African weaver bird, they make their nests by weaving together long blades of grass. And termites, well those mounds, they're cowering, and all it is is dirt and spit. Chimpanzees, use tree branches to fish out bugs for a quick snack. And beavers, or as I like to call them, nature's engineers, not only do they build their homes, they build dams capable of holding back thousands of gallons of water with just trees and mud. The next question, why can't we do this? Our answer is stick block. Using traditional lashing techniques, we are able to create rigid joints between multiple tree branches 
and tree branches and actuators. These form the building blocks of this robotic system. To demonstrate its versatility, we build two robots. The first, a crawling robot. We see it here, slowly moving across the desk. But we can envision it operating in a cluttered environment, perhaps following a natural disaster, helping rescuers map a path from points A to points B. And once that task is complete, maybe we need a gripper to help sort through the debris. In less than 30 minutes, and using the same set of materials we did for the crawler, we can build one ourselves. When I demonstrate these robots or show them off to people, oftentimes they ask me why. Not what the applications are, those are relatively straightforward and understood, but rather, why are we choosing to use these found materials when I could just be using a piece of metal or a two by four that I buy from a, a hardware store? Well, the answer is twofold. Engineering today tends to be rather inaccessible. Building things is expensive. And then there's the stigma or belief that to be an engineer, to be a good engineer, you need to have a strong math and science background. The latter, you can learn or gain with experience. Using found materials is a step towards addressing the former. And by building with these found materials, those who are doing it, they're naturally gaining the skills and experience they need to become not only engineers, to become great engineers. There's more here, though. I think we can all agree. Stuff in Philly is expensive. In low and middle income countries, that same stuff, it's even more expensive. And this puts things like rehabilitation technologies, things to help you recover from a stroke or other disease. It's out of reach for you if you live in these countries. In collaboration with Professor Michelle Johnson here at the University of Pennsylvania, we're exploring applications to address this issue. One such solution is this elbow orthosis. It is a single degree of freedom device operated via a motor pulley system at its rear. Eventually, we will include a microcontroller and operate it from our phones. The goal of this device is to help patients rehabilitate and regain loss of motion or loss of range of motion at their elbow. The beauty of this device is its simplicity. And by developing the framework necessary to build it, we're giving men and women on the ground in these low and middle income countries the skills they need to build custom orthoses specifically suited to address their needs. And should the device break, these same men and women will now have the confidence to fix it themselves rather than needing to send it to a company for repair. This past month, we submitted a paper on exactly how we built this and the techniques used. The next step is to do a case study with patients. We hope to answer two questions. Are patients even willing to use a device like this, one that looks like this? And if they are willing, just how effective are these homemade orthoses? The goal of my research is to make robotics, and frankly, engineering, more accessible to everyone. I want to give everyone the opportunity to not only be an engineer, but to become a great engineer, because we all have it in us. The building blocks to do so, they're all around us. We just have to get out there and use them. Thank you.